but how you doing? Hey, today we are working on our how to port a chainsaw series. And today we're gonna kind of start getting into the nitty gritty of it. Uh, the last video, I kind of gave you a homework assignment to read up on the squish and cylinder heads and so forth. And today we're gonna kind of review that section and kind of discuss what's going on. Now, if you're interested in this sort of a thing, don't forget to get your subscription in and hit that little alarm bell so that you uh, receive notifications when the next video comes out. So I originally intended for this video and the next video to be all included into one video. But after I made it and put it together, I realized that it was too much. So I got them split apart. So today we're just gonna kind of look at the squish band area, read up on it and kind of learn a little bit about that. And then the next video, we will pull the cylinder off and do the comparison to a modern style cylinder. Now, if you would like to follow along in more detail, we are following the two stroke tuners handbook. It is available on eBay and you can get copies of it downloaded on the internet. I am using a PDF file that I found and just downloaded it and I'm reading it from my iPad. So if you're interested, we are following the Two Stroke Tuners Handbook and you are more than welcome to get your own copy and read up on it. Now, what do you say we get on with this and take a look at the Two Stroke Tuners Handbook and see what it says about squish bands. All right, now on the last video, I kind of gave you a little homework assignment to read this section of the Two Stroke Tuners Handbook. So today we're gonna take a look at it and kind of learn what's going on and maybe get some ideas of what we're going to do. And I'm going to kind of skip through some of this stuff, uh, just kind of point out some of the things that I saw quite interesting. So up here, uh, it's talking about the efficiency with compression ratio and stuff. I want to read some of this to you. I'm going to start here in the middle. Even so, this theoretical level of efficiency calculated against compression ratio provides a useful yardstick against, against which actual efficiency can be measured. And it tells us a lot about the effects on power output of compress compression ratio. For example, at a compression ratio of five to one, as air standard efficiency is 47.5%, while at 10 to one, it is 60.2%. That is of course a very great grain, that is of course a very great gain and the consequences measured at an engine's output shaft are the reason for many experimenters is fixation on raising the compression. Certainly increases in compression ratio, which may be accomplished by simply by trimming a few thousandths of an inch from the cylinder head's lower surface can work minor miracles with an engine's performance. So more compression is more power, this is basically telling us. But if we get down here, it starts talking about some other stuff. Um, I'm going to be right here, but higher compression ratios can also bring about a mechanical disaster. Improvements in power gained in this manner are purchased at a proportionate cost of peak cylinder pressure, leading to reduced bearing life and sometimes to an outright failure of a connecting rod or crank pin. Moreover, because the higher pressures are reflected in a proportionally greater side thrust at the piston, fi frictional losses are such that net power gains are always less than the improvement one would expect from the calculated air standard efficiency. Finally, heat flow from the combustion gases into the surrounding vessel, meaning the piston crown and cylinder head and cylinder walls, raises increasingly sharply with compression ratio. So more compression, more heat, a lot more heat. It goes up a lot. So that a number of thermal related problems intrude into the already complicated relationship between compression ratio and power. The worst of these problems is the overheating of the piston crown. A too high compression ratio will raise piston crown temperatures to the point where heating of the mixture below the piston so the piston will get so hot that the mixture below the piston in the crankcase reduces the weight of the charge ultimately trapped in the cylinder during the compression stroke to such extent that net power suffers. So I think what this is talking about is, uh, you know, you do gain power with compression, but you can also take it to a point to where it starts, you know, shortening the life of the engine and everything. But you can also take it to a point to where you're getting so much heat generated from the extreme high compression 
that it starts basically affecting the gases that are below or that it start, starts affecting the mixture that's below the piston. And if you start getting to that point, you're really gonna start losing power then. So then there's like a sweet spot where more compression creates more power, but then, you know, you can get to a point to where it actually starts hurting you. It's actually raw power from you. So I'm skipping along here and I see the trick is to balance crankcase heating and compression ratio. There's an optimum combination for every set of conditions, but finding that optimum without heat sensing equipment and dynamometer is exceedingly difficult. So there's a trick to it, finding the, you know, the, the best compression ratio uh, so that uh, you're getting the most power without causing issues. So now I'm kind of skipping along here and it's starting to show about if your spark plugs offset and up basically like the flow of the flame across the crystal piston crown. And here it's shown where your spark plugs in the center and how it flows. Now we're looking for power ultimately. So this is kind of what we're looking at. Squish bands, uh, squish band type setups will give better power. And that's what this is kind of talking about. The secret of the squish type cylinder head is that it concentrates the main charge to a tight pocket under the spark plug and spreads the mixture to the cylinder bore's edges too thinly to be heated to the point of ignition. These end gases do not burn with the main charge and are only partially consumed as the piston moves away from the top center and releases them from the cooling contact with the surrounding metal. So the mixture that's caught in the squish band area will not burn in combustion during the combustion process and they will help with keeping things cool. Right there is a disadvantage that comes with squish band type silver head for mixture that does not burn is mixture that contributes nothing to power output. So the charge that's stuck in this area here won't contribute anything to power output. Its main factor is to help keep things cool under a high compression situation. So here it says that the ideal squish band is about 50% of the bore. Squish bands should constitute about half the cylinder bore area. Clearance between the cylinder head should be held to a minimum to avoid effectively losing 5% of working mixture. So it's basically telling us that the squish band itself should be about 50% of the size of the bore, but you want the clearance to be at a minimum because the more volume you have in the squish band area, that's more fuel that's wasted uh, energy basically. You want it to be close to push that charge up here. That way you get more charge for the cycle. This vertical clearance between squish band and piston should not be greater than 60 thousandths of an inch. And it is, in my opinion, that the minimum should only bear enough to prevent contact, usually about 15 thousandths of an inch in small engines with tight bearings and cylinder rod combinations that not grow with heat disproportionately and up to about 45 thousandths in big engines. Now, he, I think he's talking about the big engines like motorcycles, like 250 cc motorcycles and stuff uh, at 45 thousandths. So like our largest chainsaws could go down probably to a number closer to 25 or 30 thousandths. All right, so I hope you found that as educational as I did. Uh, more compression creates more power. Uh, I mean, that's one of those things that have been commonly known across, you know, pretty much any field of engine building, but this kind of explains it a little more detail why uh, heat becomes a problem and, you know, it causes issues with the rotating assembly and so forth, which kind of explains why race engines are commonly needing to be tore down and rebuilt more often. Makes total sense now, doesn't it? The one thing that kind of stood out to me the most though is about the heat and how it will transfer through the piston and into the crankcase. And when that happens, it can affect the charge below the piston. I found that very interesting because I have seen some extremely high compression builds and it's common for those to only be able to cut for a few minutes until they start having heat issues. And this definitely gives me a better understanding of why. Now I also understand the importance of whenever you build a firewood saw, you don't want extreme amounts of compression. 
that's because it generates a lot of heat. And the steep, and the more compression you get, the steeper the heat curve gets. So, you know, you can start out with low compression and not have to worry about the heat as much as if you had a super high compression system, uh, it, the, the, the heat buildup is quite dramatic. And that definitely explains why firewood saws typically do not have extreme high compression numbers. They, the heat will get to them and they won't last as long. Now it's time for the butt. There's always a butt, right? <laughs> so if you think about this for a minute, a higher performance saw will actually make the cut in a shorter amount of time. So the heat buildup issues won't be as bad whenever you're able to make the cut in a short amount of time. So that's kind of where the trade-off is where performance, you know, getting your heat issues and all that stuff. But that also explains the importance of running a sharp chain. A dull chain will require the saw to have to take longer in the cut. Since we have a saw with a higher performance level, it's going to be cutting longer, generating a more heat, causing the saw damage. It can create enough heat to damage the saw, which is why it is so important to be able to sharpen extremely well whenever you run a higher performance saw because a doll chain will burn it up. This explains why a lot of builders will talk about the importance of running a sharp chain on a ported saw. If you do not, the cut will take longer and it'll cause a whole lot more heat in the saw than what a factory saw would run at, causing it to burn up faster. This sure does start to explain a lot, doesn't it? So I hope by now you understand the direction I'm going with these videos. I want to explain the why as much as what to do. I want, to you, uh, I want you to understand why we're doing this just as much as what to actually do in the build. Now, I hope you enjoyed this video. You're gonna to have to wait until the next one until, until we get into the numbers of it. I'm gonna show you all about the degree wheel, finding your squish, and all that sort of stuff. And we're gonna map the whole thing out onto a little piece of paper here to a point. Um, you'll see what I'm talking about whenever I show it. So, hey, stay tuned for the next one and catch you later. Mm -hmm.